Welcome, everyone. My name is Twin. Um, today, we have a very special presentation for you all. We have a panel of three experts. Um, this is a Community Health Resource Center event. We are a nonprofit that's been operating in San Francisco uh, for 34 years, and we have four primary areas of service, um, nutrition counseling, which you will hear more a lot, you'll hear a lot more about today, um, mental health services, health education, which you are participating in right now, and health screenings. Um, I am the program coordinator for both health screenings and health education. And if you have questions about any of those programs, please feel free to connect with me with uh, via that email on the screen right now. Um, for nutrition counseling and mental health services, Community Health Resource Center is currently accepting phone and video appointments. So if you have questions about that, also feel free to um, message me at that email or tune in at the end where we can give you more information. Now uh, to introduce our wonderful three speakers. Um, first, our moderator is Dr. Ricky Polykov. She is an integrative physician, board certified in obstetrics, uh, sorry, obstetrics and gynecology. She is a founding director for education and program development at CPMC Breast Health Center. And she's also a founding member of this very nonprofit Community Health Resource Center. Next, we have Sabina Hake, one of our, um, one of our panelists, who's also a registered dietitian. Sabina has dedicated over 10 years of her career working in eating disorder treatment centers, helping individuals and groups normalize their eating and manage stressors stressors during the recovery process in a non-judgmental manner. She's seen success working with clients of ranging ages, such as teens and children. And last but not least, definitely not least, we have Jason Mosel, who is an educator, a dietitian, and a member of the HEAL Project um, board. He provides nutrition and health education to school children in San Mateo. He also is an instructor at the San Francisco State University's Holistic Health Department. Um, I'm really excited for you to hear from them. So now I will pass on to Dr. Ricky Polico, who will be sharing slides of cases and sharing the discussion with Sabina and Jason. Thank you so much. Um, I'll share my screen with all of you. Okay. And um, actually, the three of us have already collaborated for tonight's presentation in creating a slide set that hopefully will engage you all. And, um, and help you think of questions even if you didn't come armed with them. So first of all, if we look at our population of US women, and as a gynecologist, that's a huge part of my focus, you can see back in 1880, we had virtually no women who were over 75. And what percentage of our population do you think today lives without a disease burden? And this is important because as you look at the aging population from, let us take 1960, where a lot of the people attending tonight were born or already alive for several years, again, you see how rapidly our aging population has actually increased. And the age group less than 45 has actually been relatively stable. So in fact, less than half of our US population of women live without a disease burden. So what does this mean to us? It looks like this if you just think about bones, osteoporosis, and certainly this is not an uncommon image. And some of these things are so preventable, such as osteoporosis and fracture. I think we were all following Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the last several years, and we're so sorry to see her leave our um, planet above Earth. But of course, you could see from her neck, she had terrible osteoporosis. And of course, as a gynecologist, I thought that is just such a preventable tragedy that even our Supreme Court justice had suffered that. So another issue that we face, in addition to not appreciating the fact that we have an aging population, is the issues that lie behind a state of confusion. So most of us have dealt with the internet and you know, I do encourage my patients to bring me uh, articles that they pick up in magazines or whatever, but often it has actually complicated their self-care path because they're distracted by advertisements. 
there's a lot of contradictory research about food and nutrition, which hopefully Sabine and Jason will both help clarify tonight. But the marketing of nutritional supplements is also very confusing. We're basically, as we evolved as early humans, nutrition was 100% satisfactory from what we could scrounge around and eat from nature. And so do we really need all these supplements or is it just a bit of a marketing hoax? Um, I am a great proponent of integrative medicine and have basically had an integrative practice since the mid 1980s. But how do we use them wisely and how do we weave them together for your best health? Um, often complementary medicine techniques are used instead of known proven quote Western medical therapies or say for broken bone, most of us would have an orthopedist make sure that the bone is not displaced, get a cast or some splint to make sure we don't um, injure ourselves further. That's an obvious example, but there are many less clear where people avoid using standard healthcare measures and actually suffer bad consequences of disease. Clearly there's been a lot of consumer mistrust of the pharmaceutical industry and that compounded with heavy marketing by the nutritional industry can make this even more mind boggling. And then the dominant medical system, that's what I call the people with the white coats, um, obviously presents some ignorance and resistance towards complementary therapies. So that just drives consumers further away. And lastly, often people are isolated and never more than right now during COVID. So, these are our concerns as um, members of the panel, and we hope that we inspire more confidence than this. So this is a slide I made taken from the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association last uh, September, and it just shows the incredibly low confidence that consumers have in Western medical care. And this image to me is part of why we are not a machine. We are not a you know, series of organs that work as a factory with each part of the body doing a different job. We actually have to work in harmony. And so we would like to emphasize how we might approach a very typical situation showing a certain intelligence for how the three of us very often in fact share patients. So, um, I'll read the case and then the three of us will actually discuss the situation as each of us could with our own skill set, benefit this woman. So um, 34 years old, she has high blood pressure. That's what BP means, high cholesterol. She inherited that in fact from both of her parents um, and she wants to get pregnant. So the first thing we notice is her blood pressure is 148 over 96. Well, that's really not great, especially if you're only 34. And if you know the guidelines currently, that's actually 120 over 80 would be the upper end of normal for this woman. In fact, for all of us, that's ideal, 120 over 80 or less. So at five foot four, she's also significantly overweight at 163 pounds. BMI is something that we use a lot in healthcare. It's body mass index. We talked about it a little bit in our previous uh, seminar, but it's a calculation. You can dial in your own weight and height on the internet, whether you're male or female, and it will give you your body mass index and tell you if that's in a healthy range or an unhealthy range. And I use oftentimes with patients, a very simple um, formula that shows green is good, yellow is, meh, you could be a little better and red is, we know that that body mass index may be associated with health outcomes that are not so good. So in her past, she broke her leg, uh, wound up having a thrombosis in the vein in that leg and kind of thwarted her recovery. It was very painful. Also that impairs your circulation. So even as a young woman, um, we're gonna worry a little bit about would she have another problem with her leg when she's pregnant? And then of course she has the inevitable, still has knee pain and back pain. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we might approach that as a team. Background and family history. Her father had high blood pressure 
HTN is hypertension. He also had a stroke at a very young age, 48. And cabbage is short for coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So that means he had open heart surgery at age 65. So that's a very significant uh, parental history from the dad's side. Then the mother has adult onset diabetes, otherwise known as type two diabetes. And so these are the questions that we will address. So I don't know if you, Jason, or Sadina would like to go first. Uh, sure, I can get us started. Um, you know, I think when, when, a, when a patient like this comes and sees, uh, sees one of us, sees a dietitian or a health coach, um, one of the key things that we start off with is what is, what is the motivation? What, what is she really looking for? Um, and, you know, clearly here, um, fertility is, is an issue. Um, so if she's struggling with that, then we can start kind of building a, a simple plan for her to help her both understand what are the barriers maybe to achieving her goal of getting pregnant. Um, but, and also, you know, what are the factors that might be involved? It could be about, you know, improving blood pressure or, um, body weight, um, healthy eating. There's lots of different factors, of course, involved in fertility. But, but that, that first point, and, and Sabina can talk about, about what she would do too, but you know, of, of clarifying goals and motivations, and then everything kind of flows from there. What are you going to do with your uh, exercise, nutrition, sleep, stress management, you know, all those other factors that, that, are, that are involved. It, it starts with that first simple thing of, of, of what do you really want? Yeah, and of course, she wants to get pregnant, and that is definitely a huge motivator. And many women, I think, when they're planning a pregnancy, um, would like to be obviously healthy going in, having a good ha having a good pregnancy. And well, this is really only the beginning of a family, and then after that, you're going to be a model to your child or your kids, and you still have to take care of yourself to in order to be able to take care of your of them. So. Um, I really um, love the approach of looking for motivation and also like to start with the big picture rather than get all caught up in, in um, the tiny details because there are obviously always lots of details. Um, but I like them to, to take the 1500 um, foot view and go like, where's your life going? How do you want this to look like mm -hmm. um, tomorrow in a year, in 10 years? And what needs to happen for that to actually look this way? And then start going backwards and carving this into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. um, from a nutrition perspective, then um, I'm always the biggest disappointment in the office because they go like, just give me the diet. I'll follow it. I drop the weight that Dr. Polikov wants me to lose. The blood pressure is going to fall into place. Let's go. And I will say, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about what you're doing and then we'll talk about what would need to change and then we'll talk about what you're going to be ready to change and when are you ready to change that and then we'll help we'll coach mm -hmm. for you to get there because i think the first the first big pitfall always in my office for sure is like yeah let me just follow the diet and i'll do it and then everything is going to be okay and i think if I've learned one thing in what 30 years of practice is that is usually never good enough. That is maybe one step and they follow the diet and then all the motivation, everything they actually could have had is, is gone and they feel, you know, demoralized that, that, that they failed in this one aspect. So mm -hmm. that's, well, that's where, yes. I and, yeah. And I would add that um, if we only focus on weight as the goal, we're really missing the object. Oh, and so I try to exactly emphasize what Sabina has said, because uh, um, the responsibility as a mother to model to my child or children, um, I always said to patients, they do what they see, not what we say. And so, yeah, so words so. are empty. We have to model the behavior totally. So I find this kind of experience where we actually bring a group together, we do this a lot in pregnancy. 
And why we don't continue to do this or have not in the past has always mystified me because what is the most helpful thing? You will continue something if you've promised to meet a friend and go walking or exercise in other ways. You, you'll never let your friend down, although you'll let yourself down. So um, I think uh, Jason and Sabina both are doing a lot more group counseling and uh, information sharing. Yeah, and and I, I I agree with that. And one of the keys for you know you think about habit change. How do you how do you actually make these these efforts that you have or these these goals that you have a reality in your life? And getting some support is often really essential. Um, having peers who can talk through the issues with you and share their experiences, um, who you can, you know, brainstorm with. Um, you know, it's one thing to talk to professionals like us, uh, but it's it's often even better to have both our opinions and then uh, the real world examples of of people that are are, are doing are, are struggling maybe with the same issues that you are. Mm -hmm. I, I try to bring this idea that. We have a physical body. We have a mind that pretty much can make decisions, intellectually organized information, but it's really my spirit and my connection to spirit and awareness of spirit that will keep me on track. And maybe that's too woo woo for, for sort of hardcore medicine, but I've never seen people actually achieve and maintain a success in say, weight loss, blood pressure, uh, carbohydrate decrease, you know, average blood sugar now being normal. I don't see them achieve that goal and sustain it without this sort of integration of their intellectual capacity, enjoying a healthier body, and then the kind of guiding light of the spirit um, as what we do. So I think this is the kind of approach, clinical consequences of overweight or obesity that doctors have sort of pounded the desk and hit, <laughs> hit the exam table or whatever, as if that's going to drive this in. But um, I wonder if you feel there are secrets that you can share with our participants that help render them more successful, more likely to achieve their goal and sustain that goal. I don't know. Do I get to lecture the rest of the evening now? <laughs> <laughs> um, all your secrets. <laughs> yeah, all my secrets. Wow, I don't think an hour is enough for that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, in general, and this is broad strokes, but I, um, I really look at um some some really basic things that i know will make feel well make people feel better and um are worthy to focus in on over and over and over again and um and then bring them back to it as they try them and get stuck and i don't know encounter difficulties and so on and so forth um and the first one is that I, I really encourage people to eat on a regular basis. What the time frame is, that can be very personalized, but I really encourage them to eat on a regular basis. Um, and then to Re read anything or read something in particular? Nope, actually, I was going to be my next sentence. And, my, and the next thing then is once you eat on a regular basis to see if you can eat whole foods and balanced meals. And with whole foods, I don't mean the company, but I just mean like foods that you mm -hmm. actually know to be a food, you mm -hmm. know, at least amount of processing possible, um, but to also look at balance. And there is, there's obviously strong, yeah, look at that. Yeah, vegetable. My snack, my snack. <laughs> yeah, and I'm realizing that um, I don't think the flight slides that I put in actually came in, but that's okay though. I'm just going to describe it. But, you okay. know, um, so when I, when I talk about balance, I'm going, you want to look for something that gives you energy. And, you know, you want to look for something that gives you protein. You want to look for things that give you vegetables and fruits and those kind of things. And you want to eat that on a regular basis. And I can go deep into chemistry because that's what they teach me at school. But I can also go, look, um, when you look at the planet, 
We have 7 billion people at this point. Um, if we take Eskimos out and a couple of other groups, the rest of the world eats that way. And not because they all talk to Jason and me, but they eat that way because that actually works. In other words, that provides them with adequate energy um, to do what they need to do on a regular basis. And when you focus that way on eating, you can really incorporate all kinds of cultural norms, where people come from. You can individualize a meal plan in so many different ways. Um, and, uh, um, and I think that in many ways is, a, is, is an important part for people to kind of get hooked in and go like, oh, wow, she's not telling me what she thinks I should eat, but she's actually mm -hmm. going to ask me what I want to eat. And then we kind of come to this place where hopefully I can eat the things that I like and that work for me and also are good for me. Jason and I had talked about lifestyle medicine and sort of the, the fact that you kind of need to make a schedule for your self care and make time for that. And maybe you'd like to speak to some of those issues, Jason. Oh, yes, thank you. So yeah, I think um, the, the importance of schedule, especially now is, is really has been clarified for many people, you know, as most of us are sheltering in place, working from home or not working at all, that, that schedule that we relied on for, for work, meals, socializing has really uh, disappeared. So it's, it, whether that is true or not for you, it helps to understand how important it is. The body really works on a rhythm. And if we think about lifestyle in a broad sense, about holistic health, about self-care, it's about circadian rhythm. Sleep happens on a clock. Our appetites can happen on a clock. Um, our exercise contributes to that. So the more that we can become in rhythm with our bodies, with our minds, with our spirit even, and I don't think that's too woo-woo because I'm gonna use it too, <laughs> um, then the, the, the clearer we get, the more awareness we have about, you know, what, what is the healthy path for me? What makes me feel good? You know, one of the things that I'll have my patients do is to think about how or recognize how they feel an hour after they eat their meal. So that'll really give you a good sense of, did I eat the right amount? Did I eat something that was too rich? Did I eat too little? That, that question, it can be very simple, but it actually can, can transform the understanding of what your body really needs. Yeah, I, I think part of what you're hinting at too is the mindfulness. You know, that word may be a bit overused these days, but many of the people I talk to who are, have an, a desire to lose weight, they honestly are not mindful when they eat. They're eating kind of unconsciously. They're nervous, they're sad, they're bored. They're really not hungry. So part of this, I think, is to make an awareness, take the time and the trouble. And I have encouraged my patients to keep a journal, not of their foods that they're eating, but a journal kind of more like Jason has been speaking of, which is that how are you feeling? What's occupying your thoughts? Because mostly people keep repeating a habit without ever seeing the habit. So I wonder if you find journaling about sort of your intentions and clarifying goals is something that you would recommend. Absolutely, and it's one of the most effective tools for changing habits is to mm -hmm. you know, increasing awareness, but also giving yourself a little bit of accountability as well. So uh, whatever form it takes, I'll have patients you know, do something as simple as have a, have a little pocket notebook that they write it down mm -hmm. in. Other people like the gadgets and the technology and they'll use, right. there's an app for, you know, for everything and every habit and every, um, yeah. you want to drink more water, there's an app to help you do that. You know, <laughs> you, you can find it. So, but you know, Sabina really is, is uh, an expert in, in mindfulness and, uh, and I'd love to hear from her too about that. Yeah, mindfulness, um, it was, has definitely been overused, but it is, I don't know, it is such an important one to actually come to terms with because it, it involves eating 
um, but it involves actually so many other things as well. And eating is a fascinating thing uh, because we have to eat to meet our energy needs and mm -hmm. our nutritional needs, but we cannot live without food. I mean, we're not sunflowers, you know, photosynthesis is not working for us. So we're gonna have to eat. And so, um, because we have to eat and eating is trainable and hunger cues and fullness cues, this is all trainable. It is a natural place to actually practice mindfulness because you're gonna do it every day. You might as well practice mindfulness right then and there. In addition to that, because it's actually a physical act, um, you can practice identifying physical cues like, am I hungry? Well, how hungry am I? You know, or am I getting full? Well, how full am I? How do I feel after I'm eating, I don't know, avocado toast? And how do I feel after I'm eating a cheeseburger? You know, those are physical signals. Mm -hmm. and actually, physical signals are the easiest ones to identify. They're very tangible when you think about it. And once you get conscious about your physical signals, and I think journaling is, an, I use journaling all the time, all my clients journal, you know, they might fight it, but they're, in the end, they're all journal. <laughs> but, you know, once you, once you get to the physical signals, it's a lot simpler to actually figure out what all the other signals, what are, what are all the other signals? So am I actually really hungry? Or I am just, I don't know, bored? Or maybe I just have a hankering for haagen ice cream, you know? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I had a really rotten day at work and only pizza will do. Well, you know, so all of a sudden you can now go like, oh, this is the physical hunger or the hunger cues, but this is actually emotional. Mm -hmm. And this is how I think about my emotions. And now, because I'm an evolved human being with a frontal lobe, I get to make decisions, you know? You get to decide if you want to eat haagen ice cream, you know? you and that's legal but there's a distinct difference between being aware that that's a hankering or that's an answer to a rotten day than going face first into the freezer and coming out and never even knowing what happened to you um so so starting to keep take it apart and, and then basically putting it back together and then practicing it because mindfulness, I would like to point out to my groups, it's a practice. You mm -hmm. get better, just like driving a car, you're gonna get better at it, but you're gonna have to slow it down first to start understanding yourself and the world around you. And then you can perhaps increase the speed a little bit. But when I look at the next case study, I'm going, that man has a speed issue. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of mindfulness. That's right. <laughs> so here's a 45 year old man with insomnia. He cannot sleep. 5'11", pretty slender, 157 pounds, body mass index 22. Uh, that's, that's super healthy range, by the way. Blood pressure, not really ideal. The upper number, the systolic is a little bit high. You can see 140. The lower number is fine. Pulse is kind of up a little bit. We observe that a lot. Sometimes people who have a very rapid pulse have a um, upper number that's elevated. Divorced, uh, financial services career, basically healthy, had a little gastroesophageal reflex disorder, GERD. Um, he's not on anything now, but had taken uh, omeprazole, which is a um, H2 blocker that prevents our uh, stomach from secreting so much acid. This is medical therapy for GERD. Notice we haven't seen any prescription yet from a physician for other kinds of therapy, but anyway. Turns out his parents are both social alcoholics and his mom has high blood pressure, dad has liver disease. So in fact, his father probably has more than just a little social alcoholic. Um, he's actually got probably alcoholic uh, liver disease. He eats a wide variety of foods. He's an omnivore. That means he also eats a little meat. He has a pretty good exercise pattern compared to most people. You know, five out of seven days, he's running 30 to 45 minutes. And there, his little recreational speed, as Sabina alluded to. Uh, no big deal, as he sees this. And then a couple glasses of wine every night. 
uh, for maybe the last 10 years since he finished his MBA. So where do we begin? Well, you know, I think this is a this is bringing us back to the schedule question. This could be a key thing for for this person. Um, you know, maybe having the opposite issue that I was talking about in terms of our schedules evaporating. He does he have time for self care? How does he make time for self care? So one of the things that can be really helpful in working with um, a health coach or a dietitian is that we have time to really dig into these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our appointments are, are, are much longer generally than, than you can see a physician for. So we can start working on um, behavior change and uh, creative ideas about how to take care of yourself when you're really busy, including something like stress management. So, you know, we've, we've been talking about mindfulness quite a bit, and that is a very effective technique for managing stress, but there's lots of other ones. And when someone comes and talks to me about sleep issues, that's a place I'll go pretty quickly. You know, what's your level of anxiety? Do you have some way of managing your stress? And for someone like him, he might point out, well, yeah, I, I exercise. And clearly he does uh, a good amount of that. And exercise is an effective technique for helping to relax the body, but it's not always enough. And there are many other ways to, I like to call it triggering the, the relaxation response, we call it. You know, we, we, we spend most of our day, especially in sort of careers like finance, where we get that stress triggered all the time. Um, but how do we counter that? You counter that by relaxing the body. Maybe it's breathing exercises, meditation, could be some kind of calming ritual like drinking uh, herbal tea, taking a warm bath, writing in your journal, these kinds of things. Um, and I think the, you know, generally the best technique for stress management is the one that will calm your mind and your body. It's going to be individualized for you. It would, I mean, one of the things that struck me is if you're that slender and you're drinking two to three glasses of wine a night, that's a lot of your daily calories actually from wine. And so I often see women with very similar pattern where the wine just chemically relaxes them and Sabina, I just wonder, do you have any tricks of awareness of how to kind of substitute uh, that habit, which, you know, in the short term, it, it can work with um, a different, I wouldn't say um, goal, but a, a different slant that's motivating at the same time helps a little personal inquiry. Yeah, I think... Um... A, a person like um, our case here um, is um, is fascinating because if I change one thing in this uh, in this outline and I go, let me just give him another forty pounds on his frame, and all of a sudden he will be in my office and nothing has changed. But he goes like, oh, but I need to lose those forty pounds. Mm -hmm. But because he doesn't have those on his frame for whatever reason you know the wine is not affecting him i mean it is affecting him but it doesn't affect his weight um he has nothing to look at except like i can't sleep you know i need a prescription kind of thing mm -hmm. um, when it's really clear how he medicates with wine at night um i think beyond um just like i'm enjoying a glass of wine um and he doesn't um utilize any of um, the, 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 the self-medicating aspects of life that are available to him uh, in order to calm down his nervous system. And this is what this is really all about. Mm -hmm. His nervous system is all revved up, maybe because of his job, but maybe he's just a high strung or type A um, high achieving personality in general. But he doesn't really know how to bring it down. As a matter of fact, his exercise is high intensity. He loves that because it gives you a little bit of sense of relaxation. Um, but then at the same time, he uses a recreational cocaine where I'm going like, hmm, you know, I think you like the high. I think you like the, the high intensity. This is your MO. This is who you are as a person. 
Mm -hmm. So to learn to actually accept that, okay, this is what I like, or this is where I'm naturally at, but I actually need to come down. I need to learn how to wrap down my nervous system. I need to learn tools because alcohol is fleeting. It will relax you maybe in the moment, in the moment, but he probably wakes up in the middle of the night because his blood sugars drop or something like that. Exactly. Right. Um, so learning to transition from a high intensity day to to the night in order to be able to sleep um, is uh, is a hard thing to do. Actually, it's not simple. Um, and it requires lots of different tools and he needs to try out some things um, before before he goes on medication. Because yeah. sure so what, what kinds of medication, you know? <laughs> what kinds of tools uh, do you work with, with and suggest with patients to do that transition from the high energy go, go, go day to enjoying sort of quote chilling out but not using medication like alcohol or Xanax or to do that yeah a lot like what what jason already suggested you know like um maybe learning breathing activities maybe changing the ambience at night uh, mm -hmm. um, he might benefit from something like uh come home take a hot bath you know uh, do it in a dark room just have a candle going um eat a meal that is actually rich in complex carbohydrates you know this is somebody where i'm gonna yeah, I want you to eat a, past, a plate of pasta with beans on it. You know, I do. I don't want you to have the steak at night. You can have the steak in the middle of the day, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. eat grains, eat vegetables at night. Um, um, maybe something around textures, like, you know, mm -hmm. what is comfortable to you in terms of wearing? Do you have a particular kind of clothing that you wear during the day, but at night it's really, you know, there are other things that you're going to wear. Who knows? Maybe smell, maybe mm -hmm. music. Um, these senses um, are oftentimes completely understimulated during the day. You know, we wake up, we jump out of bed, we get into our head and we, we, we hit the ground running. Um, and then at night when we have to wrap down the nervous system, that's all we know. But the rest of the body mm -hmm. is actually starved for input um, that would be meaningful or satisfac uh, satisfying. So things like aromatherapy, hot bath, um, uh, satisfying meals, you know, can definitely um, um, change some of those aspects and um, show him a whole new world that might be interesting mm -hmm. in his high achieving mentality. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Jason a hard question. So, how do you, with a client like this, find resonance with what you're suggesting? And then, how do you also identify some resistance? and work with that because i think we um, all we all kind of know what we should do in the back of our mind right. and we don't do it right yes that's very true and 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 i'll often ask people you know what do you think you need to do to sleep better and you know nine times out of ten they're like well i know that i should not be looking at my phone right before I go to bed. I shouldn't have my tablet in the bed with me. I should, you know, it's not that complicated. Most of us know the things that help and, and get in the way. Right. So it's not always knowledge. And, and that's, that's a key thing for, um, for habit change. Uh, and, and again, I would go back to motivation with him. I would, you know, really get him to clarify what is the impact of, Sleep, of not being able to sleep on your life. Mm -hmm. Is it worth making changes so that you don't feel that way anymore? You know, it's horrible. Not being, we all know that not being able to sleep is, is really unpleasant. Um, so once you kind of clarify the impact and, and what the possibilities uh, of, for your life could be by making these changes, because as you both described, you know, going from the go, go, go uh, type A person to, to relaxing, that's not easy. That's a big mm -hmm. change. So um, clarifying the motivation and starting off small, you know, picking one thing to try for a week or a month even and give it some time and see how it works. And then, you know, maybe you, you journal it. <laughs> um, maybe you come back and talk more about it. And then we, we brainstorm thinking of it as an experiment, you know, and, and you're not a failure if you don't succeed. It just means we have to make a different plan. Yeah, I, 
I think I, it's helpful in my work to emphasize to patients that you're trying to be a healthy individual embedded in what I absolutely am convinced is a massively unhealthy culture. So I like to identify all of the inputs that come at us from marketing, you know, and I'm not somebody who's marketed to in any significant way, like most of my patients. You know, most of my patients watch um, a fair amount of television. They watch the commercial news channels. They're marketed to on their phones all the time. I, I, it's amazing to me. And then they have the chats and Twitter and Instagram. And I mean, there's a lot of social pressure that I think is a new part of our current era that this man would probably be in the middle of. He certainly doesn't want to miss financial trends. He wants to you know, be politically aware and know what's happening. So I think it's very helpful to say, you know, it is an uphill battle and you're trying to diverge from the herd. And I find that very supportive and also say this will take a lot of energy because, um, whoops, in fact, um, you, it is an uphill battle to not just continue to participate in an unhealthy culture. So uh, this is to me all part of habit change is you know, not to blame anybody, but to say, wow, that's true. You know, it's, it's not easy being green, so to speak. That's right. <laughs> so. And, and the food culture is a, is a clear example of that too, right? The unhealthy food culture that we're all in, it takes effort and uh, determination to, to counter whether it's the marketing or, you know, the, the, the processed food that's designed to hook us based on our evolved uh, taste preferences for sweet, salt, and, and fatty foods. Uh, mm. It's, it's, going with uh, with the flow there is is a path to to, to to disease as you pointed out with your slides in the beginning so to me having awareness on the part of physicians that we can't do this alone our patients are coming to us and what they really need is behavioral health they need lifestyle medicine they need us to respect the fact that they may have their individual preferences for their neck ache and their back pain about which this practitioner may be very ignorant. Um, I always like to suspend disbelief and study something if I'm ignorant, but that's not very typical of most physicians. I think you've also highlighted the concept, Sabina, of pleasure. Like maybe this man really never stopped to think, gee, maybe I should take off my starched collar. Of course, right now people are hanging out in t-shirt and exercise <laughs> clothes at their computers at home. But, you know, in our lives before COVID, I think many of these things um, are important. It's funny, I have a personal habit that I get home and I change into my exercise clothes because they're more comfortable. And I, if I spill food on them making dinner, that's okay. But also, I never thought of it until you talked tonight. It, it makes a clear differential between my work day and my you know, evening relaxation. Um, so now I'll respect that as more than just keeping my blouse clean. <laughs> but these things, in addition to me, are so important to actually educate our patients about the health and the, the benefits of actual food. I see a lot of people doing smoothies, you know, and buying already ground up everything and just sort of drinking it down. And I'm very old fashioned, but I think this is part of what you suggested about slowing down. Like, are you in such a hurry you don't even have time to feed yourself? Like, what does that mean? I, I have to tell a funny story. I don't know. You, I, you probably both remember this. Then when Starbucks and Pete's really got going, um, this is about 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so my daughters uh, were born in that time. 
And I vividly remember when these cups came out and everybody ran, ran around with a to-go cup of coffee and my daughter asking like, mom, what is that? And I answered, well, that's an adult sippy cup. <laughs> she has two or three years old. And, um, and, and it was such a, it was such an it was such an interesting concept um, to see um, because it's like what's happening to us even the act of drinking coffee and I mean I grew up in Europe you know you just would sit down and drink coffee or tea for that matter and you sit in the cafe mm -hmm. and it was a whole mm -hmm. cult and everything but um, it was kind of it was on the go and of course there's nothing wrong with getting coffee on the go and yet I I I I. I use this as an example of how an entire culture just melted away. Like uh -huh. the idea of the coffee house of sitting down, of enjoying, I don't know, 15 minutes of your morning coffee. And that just would go away. It would be on the go. It would be on the run. And, um, and I think that just has gotten increasingly worse over the last 20 years. And, um, right. And and I think in many ways the current pandemic is I don't want to know, I don't want to say it's going to reverse some of these things but I do think we have definitely are we are definitely getting to this place like wow you know slowing down is actually a good thing um, it's helpful to to sit down take those ten minutes have the breakfast or have the lunch um, and just and just do it that way because the body makes contact with it the body sees what's happening the body has a chance to actually digest that. I'm not against smoothies, I'm really not. Mm -hmm. But I always like to challenge somebody who swears by their smoothie. I'm like, okay, fine, have smoothies. But I like you to compare that to something like egg and toast. And then be honest with yourself, like what, how does that actually feel? And how does that actually allow mm -hmm. you to perform? Um, because a smoothie is a much faster digested food because it's processed, even though you process it in your blender, but you still grounded it up, you know, and therefore it will digest faster and your energy balance will be flatter. Um, if you eat a whole food that you have to chew, that's going to sit in your stomach and it has to, the body has to mm -hmm. do something to it, it will last longer and therefore you will feel, I mean, you basically get energy in an Excel version, you know, like slow release versus everything is dumped mm -hmm. into your stomach all at once. And your body will respond better. And you'll notice that when you start watching or listening and um, and that will be helpful to your overall um, day. Yeah, of course, I'm a great zealot for what I call playing with your food. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> when you make a salad, you're having a tactile experience with all yeah. these different colors and textures. And um, obviously this, the younger generations of women, um, they think when you make a salad, you open a plastic lid and there's your salad that you bought ready made at, you know, Trader Joe's or Safeway or um, like Stones. But the, the other area, which Dr. Lustig up at UCSF has made pretty clear is that by blenderizing, and you, you touched on this, um, you're breaking down a lot of the fiber structure. And so it actually contributes to a much higher sugar load because the, the fiber isn't there to sort of, as Sabine has suggested, slow down absorption. So I like to kind of get my patient's imagination hooked on the splendor of the whole food. Like nature is so incredibly smart like she gave us the whole leaf. <laughs> and then, then there's the potential also for the um, difference of actually having the experience in your mouth of chewing something as opposed to drinking something. So yeah, all these things, they're small, but they're tiny aspects of behavior change that again, they slow us down to Jason's point that you know slow food, is better, that's more how our intestines were designed. When we bolt our food, we have a lot more digestive issues. Our enzymes don't mix as well with the food. The, the you know, water doesn't have time to sort of mix in your intestines. I mean, there's so many interesting details that the gastroenterology specialist could uh, regale us with, but this, I enjoy sort of taking some of the science for patients and, you know, 
inviting them to the mystery of your digestion. Like, hey, you know, this has been the way it was for thousands of years. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we're going to make it better by making it faster. So I guess I'm kind of um, trying to play the, the science card because people like the details, but also inspire some of the back to nature instincts. And this gets back to a couple things that you both have mentioned about, um, you know, how we can think about how we evolved to, to eat. You know, what did we, um, what did our digestive system eat before, you know, the, the foods that we had in the past uh, before, even before agriculture, you know, it was high fiber, very dense foods and that's slow food. You know, what's the opposite of slow food, fast food. We all know the fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, these kinds of things uh, are unhealthy. And part of it is because it's very soft and it's very calorie dense and that just gets absorbed too quickly in the system. You get hungry, hungry quicker, despite, and in addition, as you're, as, as you're mentioning, Dr. Polykov, the, the blood sugar rise, the insulin rise, the, the triglycerides go up, you know, all the things we can think about in the science uh, is also there. And, and then another thing that I really like that you were, you were mentioning, which is bringing more enjoyment into eating. By slowing down, mm -hmm. we can appreciate our food more. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the colors and, and notice the textures and the flavors. What happens? How much am I enjoying it for the first three bites and then the next three bites? And then does that change over time? You know, it's just a, it's a curiosity. Bringing curiosity to your experience will really enhance it and and. You know, coming to see a dietitian isn't about, you know, getting you to eat uh, healthy foods that you don't like. It's about mm -hmm. helping you to, to enjoy healthy foods that you will like. I thought it'd be interesting to touch on a huge uh, problem in our culture, which is uh, back pain. And I see it as part of our stress. You know, everybody has their own stress button indicator, but the, the actual loss of work and so the cost to the economy of back pain, it's interesting, these integrative studies were done in healthcare workers. So um, this particular Harvard study just took people that worked at Harvard and showed basically that the team approach, which was for people who are overweight with a lot of back pain, it, it is true. Most orthopedists say, you know, if you didn't have that you know, gut hanging over, your back wouldn't be so strained and stressed. But um, I wonder if you weave some of these things in with patients as well. I have to say, I am, I am, um, I mean, of course, I'm not an orthopedist, uh, but I've had uh, my first back pain um, the other day, um, and it was clearly stress related. And I have a yoga practice for years. And if it hadn't been for the yoga practice, I wouldn't have recovered as quickly as I did. Because when I when it happened, I noticed it and I'm going, oh my God, I'm gonna do this and that and you know, evolve from there. But this this particular kind of exercise has taught me a lot of mindfulness just about my body. So when mm -hmm. something did go wrong because of stress and some silly movement that I made it was relatively easy to recover. Mm -hmm. um, and it really taught me like, wow, if you don't have that, you will be flat on your back for, I don't know, weeks on end, people mm -hmm. talk, tell me, mm -hmm. uh, in, in horrible pain and take all kinds of medication in order to come to get over it. And I don't want to say that, that, that everybody can get over it quickly, but you know, um, I think being aware of your body's um, function in, in all its aspects, and that includes obviously its back and its, you know, legs and so on and so forth, is helpful to either prevent disease or manage disease when it happens mm -hmm. or manage illness when it happens. Um, and it doesn't happen think, overnight, you know, this would yeah. not happen after my first yoga class. <laughs> yeah. I, I think most of us don't really understand how much of back pain actually comes from abdominal weakness. Yep. And so, you know, for all the people who are on our uh, webinar tonight, I think the modern explanation of the, the front to back and up to down strength and flexibility, it's so accessible, but someone has to open that door, I think, responsibly 
for us as consumers. And I do think that yoga can naturally bring these strengths front to back, top to bottom into greater balance. But I wonder, do you have, uh, Jason, uh, Sabina, do you have particular yoga types that you recommend or classes? That's what patients often ask, well, where should I go? You know, my first inclination is to say, don't start with Ashtanga, <laughs> number one. <laughs> um, so I wonder if you have a general guideline when you say yoga, there are so many types. Oh, you know, go ahead, Sabina. Yeah. I would go with something slow like restorative yoga or uh, yin yoga or and mm -hmm. methods, mm -hmm. something slow. Or um, um, I'm blanking. What's the very basic yoga? Um, hatha? Hatha. Or some mm -hmm. very, very basic hatha yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and go, I, I didn't go for the exercise. I went to learn breathing because I'm a type mm -hmm. A personality. I am the energizer bunny. I always have 25,000 things on my mind. I went because I wanted to learn to breathe, to, mm -hmm. you know, to just get a shot at it. Um, and so something slow. That's I agree. My recommendation. Yeah, and, and we all talk about um, physical fitness and exercise, you know, with all of our patients, of course. And it gets back to the same idea of, of nutrition or diet or stress management, you know, it's, it's individualized too. So I would want to get to know the, the person a little bit that's asking the question, um, you know, what, what's your body like? What is your, what is your mind appreciate in exercise? What kind of exercise feels good to you? Mm -hmm. And that can help kind of guide, you know, the, whether it's the type of yoga or maybe the yoga is not the right one for them. It might be, it might be something else, of course, but um, there are so many different ways to move the body and finding one that um, brings you joy and, and makes you feel good. You know, that's, that's the magic. And I will confess, I'm very much uh, like Sabina, <laughs> in case you couldn't guess, but that was the hardest thing for me to do. I loved ballet for many, many years and stationary bike and road biking and to kind of slow down and actually pay attention to breath. It just seems so corny. And um, I mean, I have so many internal sort of jokes with myself about being in a hurry, like hurry up and get fit. Well, the truth is that what you shared about just learning to breathe, that seems so basic, but it's the place where you actually, I think, just naturally develop the greatest endorphin calm. And for everybody who has never really had a yoga teacher or yoga class that focuses on breath, um, you're really missing out on such an amazingly simple tool. Because of course you can do it anywhere. You don't have to buy any equipment. You can do it in your street clothes or in your exercise clothes or in nothing. So, but I think it's, again, it's our culture that always wants to be marketing something. Well, there's nothing to sell really with the breath. That's, yeah. that's my observation. I, when I when I started to understand that when we when we inhale we activate our um, I think it's the parasympathetic nervous system no sympathetic nervous system the fight flight response mm -hmm. and when we exhale we actually um, activate our parasympathetic nervous system the one that relaxes this is this is an, and this is actually science this is not my yoga teacher talking this is just mm -hmm. like Yes, we get ready for fight and then we transition and we decree, uh, we, we relax from fight and we do it over and over again. Um, so it's incredibly simple, but most of us just inhale and the exhale is completely flat. And when you then do a complete, really full exhale, it's like, wow, the body actually does relax. Um, and that is a cool thing to experience. But I want to emphasize one thing that Jason says that I find so important about exercise, or I, I actually don't even call it exercise anymore. I call it movement. Um, 
we are mammals, we have large muscle groups, we need to move. This is an essential part of our, not only our health, but just of who we are. And so today there's so much movement available in so many different ways. Pick something, pick 10 things, make it fun. It should be mm-hmm. enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It is not about um, how many calories you're going to lose or burn or how many miles you're going to run. Or I don't know. You know, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It has to mm-hmm. be joyful because if you have fun, if it is joyful, mm-hmm. this will be the most powerful motivation for you to do it again and mm-hmm. again mm-hmm. and again. And that is how you build a habit. Um right. And so positive feedback loops are really powerful pieces to identify. And exercise is obviously a key one. Um, Mm -hmm. It carries so many, I mean, I always say like, yes, one of the points is weight loss, but there are a hundred of other points that exercise does. Can we Mm -hmm. focus on a couple of those ones too, please? You know, Great. joy and movement. I, I know we have a lot of questions in our queue. And um, I just want to make one comment on breath because it's a free and available on the internet. It's kind of quirky, but uh, this man named Wim, W-I-M, Hoff, H-O-F, has, I mean, he has a lot of interesting notions and it's working for him. But I really recommend trying his suggestions. He coaches, he will have all kinds of free YouTube with Wim Hoff. And it's as corny as can be. And for many people, I, I get to see them laugh when they first try it. And that's to Sabina's point, has to be fun. It li- seems a little silly, definitely not in most of our experiences, um, but it's a very simple technique and you don't have to believe in anything, but he coaches you through it. And I, I just want to add that uh, Wim Hof, who gives this away free. That's another one of my um, requirements for a good teacher. They're not trying to make millions off of you. They actually just want to help you help yourself. So I know Twin's going to give us some questions. Yes, we have about 25 more minutes of our presentation time. We have 10 Q&A questions. We'll start with the questions that were submitted during the registration. Um, Are we all ready? Sure. All right. Uh, Let's see. Any special advice for us with Parkinson's disease? Well, of course, uh, presuming the medical therapy has been embraced and a pretty good regimen for frequent, um, you know, use of medication, if you've been diagnosed with that, Um, This is a terrific question for the group of us because my observation with my Parkinson's patients is the medication is a small piece, but their body uh, practices, their mindfulness, their nutrition, especially the types of exercise they do. What what would you say, uh, Jason, regarding Parkinson's? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And there's so many great programs out there for um, movement with Parkinson's. Um, the ballet, the San Francisco Ballet has, has, a, has a wonderful one um, that, that, that I believe is free and, and people can participate in. And our um, Institute of Health and Healing, IHH, has uh, Qigong and uh, Tai Chi right. uh, classes. And also they offer some yoga as well, which is mm-hmm. fabulous for balance, coordination and uh, movement, smoothness, all these things. And it's fun and you get to be in a group. Right, right, yeah. Getting back to that importance of group um, um, support. Uh, and, then, and then from a nutrition perspective, um, you know, this, this idea that we keep talking about of schedule, spreading your food out, you know, often with something like Parkinson's, the medication requires you to have um, your meals at certain times. Um, in order to absorb the medication correctly, you need to have an empty stomach. So mm-hmm. it, it requires a, a lot of planning. We haven't talked too much about that, but um, for healthy eating, you know, planning is, is probably the most important thing you can do. 
Mm -hmm. um, for, for conditions like Parkinson's, there's often uh, some side effects to, to the disease process, which then, you know, nutritionally we can help manage, whether it's uh, constipation is a common one, mm -hmm. um, or perhaps some kind of swallowing difficulty or, or dry mouth, for example. Um, I like to really add um, that um, I find that stress management is really key in, uh, in Parkinson patients. I find that when they are stressed, um, that uh, symptoms tend to increase or, mm -hmm. you know, the motor function decreases or tremor, tremor is worse. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, so understanding what stresses them and what relaxes them, um, uh, is really important and create practices around that, um, that keeps them balanced and, um, uh, and calm. Thank you for that. The next question here. My binge eating is very much consistent with my depression. I can feel mm -hmm. myself getting unhealthier, but I can't find motivation. That's such a great comment and question. And, you know, I have a little sign I made up years ago, which was one loses with love, not with loathing. So this is all part of the mood cycle. So, you know, if we hate being fat and we grab the parts of our body that are overweight and just, you know, like we're admonishing ourselves with disgust, that's not compassion. So to me, how we take the intellectual understanding of compassion to self, okay, that's the hardest thing. And we can talk to therapists sometimes till we're blue in the face about, you know, the, the way we got stressed or depressed in life and feel very stuck. I definitely think there's a chemical component. And for many women that I see, um, they are liberated with better medical sort of neurotransmitter balance by an appropriate medication. And so I'm actually, this is part of integrative medicine. I really embrace a medicating psychiatric consultation instead of just assuming that, yeah, I've tried Prozac, I tried Zoloft, I tried SI, you know, whatever. There's a long list of maybe things that people tried, but I, I really like to work with a medicating psychiatrist for people that suffer the blues. It's a terrible stuck feeling. And then I love working with Jason and Sabina to, to draw out some of these sort of sleeping strengths that we, we kind of run right past. So I want to toss the question to them, the comment, how you would work together. Um, well, um, so if, if it is, um, diagnosed binge eating, then best practices would be to find a therapist that is trained in eating disorders, um, as well as a dietitian, as well as a psychiatrist, and to create a team um, to start the journey of recovery. It's usually never just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually not about the food, though. The food is a clear symptom, obviously. Um, but it is a um, it is a it is a recovery path that is um, that needs to be attempted in a team, and there are multiple parts to it. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I know that it's oftentimes overwhelming to like, oh my god, I got to see all these people, I got to do all these things. But um, I do I do think they all have their own um, importance in this in this approach, and then um, you slowly move. Um, through the different phases of your recovery. And um, there's hope, there's definitely hope um, to get better. Eating, overeating, binge eating is a, is a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there are other coping mechanisms that are not self-harming. Um, mm -hmm. But that needs to, that cannot just be picked up from the shelf, like, okay, well, let me do that. No, no it's mm -hmm. something to identify, to sort out, and then to practice and um, see um, um, what kind of support you need. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. It, the team, and 
I, I admire women so much who will be honest with me because the first thing in our culture that we bring on, on ourselves is shame. And so if whatever our issue is, if it's got shame attached to it, um, I think it makes the bars in our prison even more difficult to escape. And it's so refreshing to take an integral view. And I, I really find this concept of self-compassion and then you realize that everybody who works in this space, in this area, has so much love and understanding, true empathy for the complexity. And not that any one person has the key and will unlock that prison, but there are so many joyful paths to um, unwinding that behavior and the habit. And, you know, I actually had a patient this week and she's lost 37 pounds in the last year. And she has about another hundred to go, but it's been really a, a beautiful, slow process of not just as Sabina said, she hasn't focused on her eating disorder and her binge disorder. She about a year and a half ago saw a new psychiatrist, went through a lot of um, medical testing and she had a, a subtle abnormality with her thyroid. We're always hoping for some metabolic thing, but it was just a little bit of many things. And actually she was telling me that she thinks her breathing practice, which she became aware of how much stress and tension she held in her throat. And of course, for all people who stuck down emotions with eating issues, um, having other ways to release that that don't necessitate food. It, it may be part of what Wim Hof has to offer because you know, if you're so busy breathing, um, it's, it's just such an intense effort, but it also leaves you extremely relaxed. So I think we're finally in medicine getting to a place where it is in working as a team. And hopefully um, our attendee who's asked the question, if she um, is obviously part of the CHRC network that she can work directly with either Sabina or Jason and assemble maybe a better team. You know, whenever people feel stuck, well, we just haven't found the right team yet is a better way to look at it as opposed to I've failed. So Jason might want to add something. I don't think so. I think the, the okay. two of you have handled that really well. And, and I, yeah, I, I agree with, with all this, uh, all the, the approaches Thanks. that you both mentioned. Thank you for your answers. Um, we have about 14 minutes of, of left of Q&A, and I, I'm sorry to make us feel rushed, but we do have a ton of questions, 10 questions left. Um, the next question is, what are the best ways to lose weight in a healthy, easy way over 50? Yes, um, and I, you know, to give us a, that's not a simple question, but um, we'll try to keep it short, of course. Um, this is the, the, the magic bullet we're all looking for. What's the safe, easy, simple answer, right? Um, it's not always that, that easy, of course, as many people know. Um, but one of the things we talked about that I would recommend um, that Sabina mentioned and, and Dr. Polycove is food journal. You know, keep track of what you're doing. Bringing attention to the page um, brings attention to the mind. Uh, this will really help you start to see, you know, where maybe are the, the points in your um, your food consumption that might be getting in the way of you uh, mm -hmm. losing weight. So, you know, once you kind of clarify that point, um, it can help you kind of see the path because it really does need to be individualized. So, you know, I don't think we don't have one particular diet that we might recommend to someone, um, but, but more of an approach to a place to get started. And I would say generally, we as a culture eat too many carbs and they're so easy uh, and hidden in many things. So especially women after 50 have a tendency to deposit extra calories right around the middle. That's actually well described medically. So I would say the first thing is to look at carbohydrates, which are not necessarily uh, part of 
um, the healthiest metabolism, especially most people are less active after 50. So that's another aspect of changing your diet uh, because you want lower glycemic index foods. And this is kind of the science of it, but um, when you look up glycemic index of foods and you see what's high glycemic index and what's low, it's like, okay. I mean, it's kind of like a game, like, okay, how, how much can I enrich my low glycemic index foods and enjoy it? So many times no one ever suggested that and it actually works pretty well. And again, we're, we're always curious. Humans love to do new things. Um, so I think that's a, a very good question and it's kind of a simple answer, but I would definitely look on, on the um, website for the National Institutes of Health. They have some really great information. They actually separate into men and women. So you'll see a lot of good tools there. Um, I am looking at the Q&A questions and the next one fits in beautifully. It kind of summarizes both of our cases. Uh, poor sleep, poor diet, highly stressed. Um, and, you know, like what, what to do, where do you start? Well, I would personally vouch for starting with either Sabina or Jason, uh, the health educators in Community Health Resource Center. This is exactly what um, I passionately have supported this endeavor to offer very cost-effective, can't pay, then we raise money. We have a foundation that funds the Community Health Resource Center so that it is open access to everyone. And that's exactly where I would start with those issues. And we have um, group classes that we offer as well as individual. And in fact, group classes work, I think almost as well as one-on-one, -on -one. Um, certainly for starters, especially because the group offers community buddy support. And I especially have many women who have met other women, for example, who you know go to the class, but they're widowed also. And then they do the Sabina, they go down and they have the adult sippy cup at Starbucks or Pete's. But you know, these are absolutely essential ways to get unstuck. And um, I think our, our health educators really have a fantastic track record of success. So I'll answer that question for them because um, I can see what a beautiful difference it makes. And many times um, it's a lot cheaper too to go to a group class. So, um, uh, the next question is uh, right up the educator's alley, which is um, about chronic fatigue syndrome and um, what you would advise, uh, where to start. Um, Sabina. Um, okay, so I think with any of the um, um, autoimmune conditions, um, I, I besides the medical um, treatment, obviously, of the condition itself. But I think finding what really works for you and stabilizing your overall self-care um, in all the areas is going to make your management of this condition better. Because I think... Um, I think I'm. I, I think I'm correct to say like that's going to stay with you. And what you really want to learn is live with it and making, you know, creating the best quality of life. Um, and that goes back then to well, how do you eat? How do you sleep? How how do you have fun? Um, um, what kind of exercise do you do? And so on and so forth. Um, and all these factors will make a difference um, in your ability to uh, to manage the condition. Yeah. And happily, we're learning more and more things about actually how the inflammatory lifestyle, which is hugely affected by what we eat and how we eat, mm -hmm. can influence your immune system. And so I think we're opening a whole new field, which is really at the crux of a lot of, I think, chronic fatigue. Um, and we can look more deeply into these things, I think, through community health resource center uh, classes, but I'm a great proponent for working with health educators and nutritionists and counselors. Um, there was a question that was posted. Um, do we know who's healthier, people who just go to doctors or people who see nutritionists too? And I would call health educators. And clearly the people who go to nutritionists do better. You know, doctors have limited time on their hands 
and they'll tell you you need to lose weight, but they obviously uh, don't have the ability to help you lose weight. So um, that's what I love about practicing at 2100 Webster because I can send people downstairs and they can uh, work with the team. Um, another question about breathing and mindfulness. I really think it takes kind of a class experience. And fortunately now everything's on Zoom. So as funky as it seems, um, I see a lot of women who actually, because they're on screen time for the first time, they sort of had their breakthrough with breathing because it is so accessible. And you know, you never got a parking ticket because you didn't go anywhere <laughs> to do it. So I think we have some options that have actually come to us as sort of the, the bright side of an otherwise pretty dark era. Um, so I really encourage people to look online and <clears throat> I don't know, does our community health resource center have sort of a resource pool of online events that you would endorse? Okay. Absolutely. And, and, you know, both, uh, both Sabina and I offer, uh, group classes, um, and I'm doing a, a mindful eating class, uh, which, uh, you will learn how to, to, to breathe and meditate in that class. Um, you know, mostly focused around around eating, but but also just around relaxing the body in order to to access that. So, you know, that's that's one place you can go. We also have recorded um, uh, health education talks like this one, um, where you can learn about a wide variety of of, of issues and, and conditions. Um, and and as you mentioned, um, Dr. Polykov, there's so many great online. And I'll get back to the to the app solution. <laughs> There's lots of great apps to help with. Um, They're free um, with breathing and meditation as well. Mm -hmm. I like to point out though. Um, so individual counseling is obviously really important to individualize a plan, but there is a true power in learning as a group. Um, for example, school is in groups um, on purpose. Um, not mm -hmm. everything is going to be fun to teach in a group, but there is something that we humans you know, learn from each other, how we respond, the questions we ask. Um, and, um, you know, that, that really helps us to understand and further our own understanding and our own practice. So um, group lectures, groups in general um, are, are helpful and are an intricate part of learning. Um, not the only way, but definitely an intricate mm -hmm. part of learning. I, I also want to just confess I first tried, you know, meditation, mindfulness, breathing, yoga, starting in 1987. I hope this is not too discouraging, but um, I feel like I got it about four or five years ago. Now, that may be so discouraging to people, but I think the essential thing is that I didn't give up. And you know, I know I'm my own worst enemy with wanting to do more than I have possibly human time to do. And as efficient as I can be, you know, my New Year's resolution for the last three years has been to slow down and to be contented with the journals that pile up that I haven't read and not lose sleep over it. Like, you know, as I say to my patients, you know, you got to make time for joy. Um, one of the comments was, what advice would we give uh, to get away from processed foods um, to make things affordable and tasty plant-based recipes? Well, it's amazing what's available free on the internet in this. And, you know, I think this is where Sabina and Jason help people. This is exactly what we do at Community Health Resource Center. Um, and I don't know that we're yet into when cooking classes, maybe we'll partner years ago, about 20 years ago, we did partner with Tanta Marie's cooking school over in the, um, actually it's, it's off of um, Fisherman's Wharf area, kind of in that area between um, our Italian neighborhood and Fisherman's Wharf anyway. And we were actually teaching people how to cook healthy uh, with actual real food and chopping things up. And, you know, it's just so much fun it's like being a kid again in a classroom with clay and watercolors or whatever. So I really hope we can get back to some of that once COVID is over, but um, learning from 
actually books is possible, but now there are so many wonderful videos online um, to take you from some weird vegetable that you've never met before and how to peel it and how to you know, prepare it and cook it or even spiralize it. I mean, we really, if you can get into food as a playground as opposed to something to be feared and you know, a lot of people didn't have a mother or father that made the kitchen an invited space. Um, I was lucky to grow up with somebody that that was really one of her areas of great creativity and joy. And I transmitted that to my daughter. And, you know, now I've got a three and five year old granddaughters who, you know, kind of have that tradition. So I do think it's easier when it comes, when you come by it naturally, but this is one of the wonderful things about the internet online videos for all kinds of cooking. And I'm sure uh, Jason and Sabina cover this also in their classes. I teach people how to cook. Um, yeah, and I'm sure Jason does the same thing. Um, and um, I, I, but I agree. Um, the internet is my friend. Um, YouTube mm -hmm. is my friend. Um, there are lots of great things you can teach, so you can learn there. Um, but I wanted to get back to this concept of like, well, what about money? How how will I mm -hmm. afford this? And um, I don't, um, I don't know if this is available to everybody. But um, even, I mean. I like to start with a Cali with the San Francisco Food Bank, which is actually one of the best food banks in the nation. They not only give processed, I mean, um, canned foods and processed foods, but they give fresh foods and whole foods and produce. Um, and I and 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 I go, you can get food inexpensive in season, um, and then you can go on YouTube and find the recipe. Mm -hmm. Now. If right now all you do is eat processed foods and fast foods, well, don't don't revamp the entire week, but perhaps take one day a week and go like, all right, I want to cook one dish, and what do I need to do for that, and where could I get inexpensive ingredients? Whole foods will always be cheaper than processed mm -hmm. food. The money you will put in is your time to create a dish, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, you can feed a family, well, you can feed one person on $50, but you're going to need to learn how to cook eggs and beans and rice and stuff like that. So start with one dish, start with something that you want to learn how to make that you like, and then start your journey. Um, don't put too much pressure on that one meal, like the whole family has to eat it for a week, too much pressure. What happens if it doesn't taste good, you know, like, but start someplace, um, and then before you know it, I mean, the week only has seven days, 21 meals, only seven of those really have to be cooked, you know? So it's not that hard actually. So, but keep it in perspective. And, and I would echo what Sabina said that it actually is cheaper to, to I mean, I grew up never having packaged food because it was too expensive. And then, you know, that's your taste bud. And, you know, I mean, that's obviously very fortunate and even as a busy doctor, to me, you know, grocery store, look at all those vegetables and fruits. It's, it's happy time. <laughs> even in COVID with a mask, it's, it's like I chill yeah. out. Maybe that's what happens to other people when they watch TV. But, you know, I see that as part of my recreation. And I, I hope to share that with everyone to, to take that attitude like, you know, I'm just a cave woman in um, modern life, but I have my ancient body and I'm going to try and, you know, dance this dance as close to my cave ancestors as I can. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we might have already answered one of the questions here. What is your take on plant-based vegan lifestyle? Um, and then there's one more last question after that. And it is, is there any healthy or holistic way to transition off antidepressants and manage mental health with lifestyle? Well, I can start with a plant-based lifestyle or plant-based diet. Um, you know, it is, it is one of the healthy ways to eat. When we, when we talk about um, healthy eating, we look at healthy eating patterns. So whether it's vegetarian or it's um, omnivore, uh, Mediterranean, um, there's lots of different ways to eat healthfully, and this is one of them. It's also important to, to the reason that we, we talk about plant-based is that it really, that really emphasizes the whole foods nature. So you wanna be eating 
real foods, eating, you can eat a vegan diet that's very unhealthy as well. You know, things like Oreos, those are vegan. It doesn't mean it's healthy, right? So sometimes we have this, this concept called a health halo, which is if you put a term that people think is healthy onto a food, then they think that food is healthy too. So that's true with gluten-free sometimes. Um, and now it might be true with something like a vegan donut. You know, it's still a donut. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. And then there's one last question here. Are there any healthy ways to, or holistic way to transition off antidepressants and manage mental health with lifestyle? I would say it is possible, um, but must be done safely in consultation with the medicating physician. It is possible. I've seen patients slowly taper off of prescription meds, but I've also seen it backfire when not done in consultation with the clinician and it, that can be pretty catastrophic. I think probably one, one of the hardest is in bipolar disorders um, where often when people are feeling good, they, you know, I've been on this for years and I wanna get off of this stuff. A lot of, a lot of people feel that way and yet it can be very um, painfully obvious after this very enthusiastic, happy time uh, with confidence when people bottom out again. So, you know, sometimes just chemically, our mind, brain, emotions are stabilized because we're on medication. And so um, it's tough, especially when there's a family history of moods up and down. And if there's been any schizophrenia or psychosis where, you know, my reality is really not in alignment with pretty much everybody else's. So I'm pretty careful to ever casually say, sure, you can do that. Because a lot of people um, really can't do that safely. And then if they've been falsely reassured, oh yeah, you can get off quote that stuff. But in fact, that medication balance may be why you felt good enough to, you know, want to be medication free. So I know on the one hand, we have a, a, you know, medication happy culture. We've just talked tonight a lot about stress illnesses. So, you know, right now, should we just go out and medicate our stress? No, we're great advocates for working on a deeper level within myself and using behavioral lifestyle modification and mindfulness practices. And on the other hand, um, in acute severe situations, sometimes you know, when there's been severe illness or death or injury and people are freaking out and they're not sleeping, well, for a temporary time, we do use meds. Um, so I like the integral approach where you know, we may have a temporary um, transition time that's not in our optimal wish state and then we get back to healthier life. But I would definitely work. There are some psychiatrists who are famed and, and I mean, well-known in a good way for um, working with clients to get off medications if possible. And I think through the Community Health Resource Center, uh, we can probably help this person um, find some clinicians in the Bay Area who are very responsible and also share that belief. If you can get off some meds or all of them, let's see if that's possible, but I would definitely not do it by myself uh, with a good cookbook in hand. So just thank you careful. so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Polly Cove. And thank you, Sabina. And thank you, Jason. Um, I wanted to reiterate what all three of our panelists mentioned that Nutrition counseling is more than just figuring out what to eat, but they also dig into your behaviors and your emotions. And if you're interested in appointments with us, we are accepting virtual appointments by phone or by video. Um, you can call this number for questions about uh, coverage and scheduling or email this address here. And then lastly, I wanted to give a reminder for our next health education lecture coming up this December, led by Dr. Jennifer Guy of the PNC Liver Cancer Program. It will explore liver diseases, risks, causes, and treatments. 
Um, and that will be our last lecture of 2020, but more will be coming in 2021. Actually kicking us off in January will be Jason's group class for mindful eating. So for those of you who are still learning about breathing or figuring out if it's working, Jason is the person that you want to you want to reach out to or look out for that post event email. I will go into details about mindful eating there for or his class. And Sabina will also be leading a, an emotional eating support group for those of you who are looking for um, a longer class series that uh, each session is longer and really dives into what you have in your pantry, what you are eating at night or for your meals. So look out for that post event email. It will contain a bunch of things such as our feedback form also. Um, our panelists, is there anything you guys would like to leave with our participants before we sign off? Just thank you all for attending and joining us. Yes. It's, our, it's our passion to help everybody be their best, healthiest, happiest self. Thank you for coming and have a happy and healthy holiday season. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking with you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Jason. Yep. Thank you. And so don't much. forget to make time for self care and self compassion. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye.